mask. Sorry. <laughs> um, everything, if I were to take my appendages, which are four limbs off, what I'm left with. However, functionally, you would see the clavicle and scapula, which are located on your axial region, but they're part of the appendicular. Same thing with down here. The coxal region is technically useless without the function of your leg, right? So it's categorized in the appendicular region. So it's not just what's there besides those two areas. So now we're on the vertebrae. And the cool thing is, uh, this is what I didn't find on the last video, so since this is part two, here's our hyoid bone. And that's all you need to know as far as identifying what this is. There is nothing else in the body that looks like it, but you would be surprised what kind of answers I receive. So make sure you do get a chance to Where look it? at it. Mm -hmm. It is the only bone that does not articulate with any other bone. So it's on the level of like C5, C6. So if you were to count down from your skull, the little tiny um, projections, six of them, and go forward, that's about right there. Okay? So that's your hyoid. So how does it stay in place? Muscles. 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 We have a lot of muscles there to hold it in place. So now the vertebrae. My favorite thing ever. Might be a little biased. And let's get uh, some of these shown to you so you can see the difference of them. get back to the atlas and axis. Because I found the atlas. All right. First, we're going to learn about the spine in, in total real quick, and then we'll show you the vertebrae, which are components of the spine, right? So Mr. Skeleton is going to help us kind of visualize the entire spine itself. And then in lecture, we'll cover, you know, stuff like why is it curved and, and what's going on as a unit. But there are three major parts of the spine. So now what have we obviously taken off? Skull. What did we not call that? The skull. Skull. <laughs> so the skull takes you know, to take it off, and then we can see this structure that is keeping everything on the posterior side intact, and everything on the anterior we see kind of joins there. So we kind of visualize that's what's going on. There are three major parts of this spine, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, okay? We eat breakfast at 7, lunch at 12, and dinner at 5. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. 7, 12, 5. If you are a basketball player or have an anom anomaly where you were born with an extra vertebrae, it's typically your lumbar, sometimes it's your cervical. So you may have. But for the everyone else who read their textbook and was designed the way your textbook said it should be, then it's 7, 12, 5. Okay, so no forgetting that. And I want you to also look at the size of certain areas of the spine. What do you automatically notice? The neck smaller, the support structure is bigger. As we go towards the feet, and what's the term for towards the feet? Inferior is one, but there's a specific one. Starts with a C. Cephalad is the opposite of it. Caudal. Excellent. So as we're going caudal, your bones get bigger. Why? Support more weight. There's more weight as we're going down. So up uh, by the neck, we're going to have tiny little vertebrae as opposed to low back. Is that safe to say? All right. So let's look at a couple of those and look at the features. So I want you to see 
that this is a tiny little vertebrae, and you can tell me already that you could probably think it is in where? Cervical. The neck, the cervical region. So this is a cervical bone. What is sticking out to where you can palpate on yourself is the spinous process. And how you know that this is a cervical if you forgot that they were small and you would see what is known as a bifid spinous process, which means in formation it looks like I was going to cut it in half and I didn't. You see that? Bifid. What is this hole for? Your spinal cord. So this is the vertebral foramen. Because if I were to put this all the way up and attach the skull to it, where would it connect with? Foramen magnum, right? So it's just the extension going all the way down to what used to be our tail. So vertebral foramen, spinous process, and then anteriorly, we call that portion the body of the vertebrae. So the body, I can just pinch on a cervical spine and see that that way. The body is definitely more prominent the further inferior or towards the feet we go. You see how it gets thicker that way? Same with the spinous process. Okay, so cervical, spinous, body, and then we have two regions which are better seen in this nice thoracic one. The two areas that come up and make up this body is known as the pedicle. So it's this specific region here and on the other side. So you have on either side. The two areas that come together here to make that spinous process right here is known as the lamina. So lamina, pedicle, body, spinous, and these are also processes, but what direction are they pointing? Transverse. So these are transverse processes. Then, if I were to construct my spine, and no, these don't really go together, but I'm just doing this so you understand how they're going to be put together. We have an inferior articular process and a superior articular process. So inferior, superior, spinous process, transverse process, lamina, pedicle, body. Easy peasy. Lemon squeeze. That's what my daughter says. <laughs> uh, another thing is, so you will have one station. Not only are you identifying parts of the vertebrae, like we said, but you're also going to have to tell me which vertebrae it is. And I get some numbers there. How in the world would you know what number this is? <laughs> you, you are psychic. <laughs> so you wouldn't. You really wouldn't. Unless it's coming from the spine itself, that's the only way you can count and number it. Otherwise, you don't know. But you can tell me what type of vertebrae it is. You can either tell me if it's a cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. Lumbar looks like a moose. You see it? <laughs> This? I'll get you a better thoracic. Thoracic looks like a fox or an anteater. This? Not right. These on top. <laughs> Wrong. The mnemonics are waste if you don't know what it meant to trigger something else. And then this cervical is a giraffe. I don't see the giraffe, do you? I can. I see the giraffe. Yeah. A little ear. Well, then that didn't work. So maybe this was the fox. No, it worked. Moose, fox, giraffe. Okay, good. Cool. And if you forget, the thoracic has the spinous process pointing inferior. Why? Because when you bend down your toes, they have to like flare out and flare back in. So. These are really there for us to like rotate as well as our 
neck. So those are our vertebrae. Any questions on that? We're good. So there's the first two bones in the neck, which are your cervical bones, C1 and C2, are totally different shapes and sizes and everything. Why? Because this is exactly where, I'm going to put baby skull on here, just for kicks. <laughs> <laughs> so these are designed for our head to rotate and say no to drugs. <laughs> you know, every little bit I can't. Just throw that at there. Don't do drugs. Ever. Ever. Bad news. All right. So clearly C1 has a completely different shape. There's no body. Like, nope, no. No body of the vertebrae. This is somebody's body. But there's no body and there's no spinous. There's little bumps that would be spinous processes, and that is known as the tubercle. But I don't even have you identify that. Okay? Atlas. And how do you think of that? Is it holds the, the skull. It's like the atlas, right? Axis, however, has a prominent feature. And this process is also known as the odontoid process or the DENS, D-E-N-S. I think DENS is easy to spell. So that's the one I would suggest you memorize. And this is your C2, which is your axis. So the atlas rotates on the axis. That kind of makes sense, right? And so that's the only feature that I'm requiring you to know for the axis. So one of my things, you know, a, a good FMQ for me is mixing this up with the vertebrae. You didn't look at it. It's clearly the hyoid. Nothing else looked like it. It looks like devil vampire teeth. And you know what they're called? Lesser horns and greater horns. <laughs> so I always used to relate it to devil teeth. Or devil teeth. Now we're going straight down to the extension of the spine, and we see this structure down here that holds both of the coxal regions together, so to speak. And it's kind of like a triangular shaped bone, and this is known as the sacrum. The sacrum has two areas where these places um, the coxal region attaches to, and that's known as the ala. So I have an individual sacrum right here. So the ones that flare out over here are ala. And ala mean wings. So the sacral era, ala. Where would you think sacral foramina was? Mm -hmm. All of the holes. Look at how much awesomer you are than when you walked in today. So sacral foramina. All right, so that ends the vertebra part. I'm going to keep going with the thoracic cage because it's fairly, you know, simple. Then we can be done with the axial skeleton. Okay? So let's keep going. All right, I do have individual bones for, for both the ribs, and I'm just going to show you for demonstration purposes as well as making it easier to identify. So this is the sternum. And everybody see where we kind of took this off of? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the sternum. And I always want you to think of a sternum as a tie. The manubrium is like the knot. This is the body. And the xiphoid process is your tip of the tie. So manubrium, body, xiphoid process. What letter does xiphoid start with? X. And then remember that jugular foramen all the way up to the skull? And I said it was a vein that went from the top of the head, and it has to go back into eventually drain into the heart. So it's got to be on either side of your neck to do so. And this notch right here 
on either side is known as the jugular notch. And then here's how we label the ribs. You'll see that there's a few things going on. This is all costal cartilage. Costal cartilage holds some of the ribs to the sternum. So when you get down to about this level, you'll see that cartilage actually attaches to cartilage and the ribs don't articulate directly with the sternum. You see that? So one through seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, are considered true ribs. Then eight through 12 are considered false. However, we've given another category to 11 and 12 that are known as floating. Apparently Janet Jackson took those out to make her way smaller. Way smaller. I believe it. So that and that, okay? And sometimes, very rarely, you'll see a cervical rib to where the last cervical vertebrae, C7, their transverse processes will still be there, but then you'll have another extension of a rib here. And those people tend to have issues when they sleep on their arm and the rest of it goes numb. So they probably have an extra cervical rib. You don't have to have it on either side. Sometimes you do, so that happens a lot. So that's the axial skeleton. Go. Memorize it.